I'm McDonald. This week on Rough Cut, we are building the Super Contemporary Table. Now, it's based off an old school 1950s design that I got out of my dad's basement because it's <laughs> a collapsible TV tray and I just love it. I'm going to show you how we make these curved legs and how to get a beautiful top out of a single piece of wood. We'll be joined in the shop today by newcomer, my friend, co-designer and builder, Jesse Shaw. And it's all coming up next, right here on Rough Cut. Major funding provided by Woodcraft. Woodworking is a passion. Woodcraft understands that. We offer name brands and tools for fine woodworking. Table saws, band saws, routers, hand planes, chisels, and much more. And employees who love woodworking just as much as you do. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work. Proud sponsors of Rough Cut, Woodworking with Tommy Mack. Additional funding provided by DMT Diamond Sharpeners, made in the USA and helping to give woodworkers sharp edges since 1976. Tight Bond Wood Glues, the pro's advantage. Microjig, maker of the gripper. Work safer, work smarter. And by Pony Tools and Stare It. All right, gang, say what's up to Jesse Shaw. What's up, buddy? Hey, Tommy, great to be here. Man, you know what, I gotta tell you, Rough Cut Woodworking really does bring people together. Do you remember a few years ago, we did the show down at the Four Point Channel in Boston with that bench design competition, and I showed you the one that I thought represented that area the most? Well, actually, you're the guy who built it, right? Yeah, yeah, I built that, did that contest. It was great, and it was so cool seeing it on your show. You came in, you assessed the bench. It was just how I thought of it. It was kind of like I was explaining it. Yeah, so we were on the same page right away. You know, a year and a half goes by and I get this random phone call from this dude and it was you saying that you would build that bench, right? Yeah. And since he lived right down the street, I was like, hey, why don't you come on down to the shop and check it out, right? So I had this crazy idea of a TV tray this week and I gotta tell you, he wasn't sold on it at all, right? Makes me think of my grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hear you. So we sit down and we start designing. So why don't you show us what we came up with? So we came up with a bunch of different designs. First, we sketched out one that had uh, these nice little arc curves. And after that, we made an eighth scale model. These so things made, are so cool, man. It's a great way to get a three-dimensional version of what you're looking at. Yeah, and since this piece needs to be functional, you can really see the shortcomings in it as well, right? That's true. Because look at it, it falls right over. So you decided to build a full-scale model, and here it is right here, man. And it's still collapsible. And I think that it looks great. Dude, it almost looks like it could be on the Enterprise, you know what I mean? <laughs> but since I want this to be a TV tray, it's really tippy, and I knew I would be wearing whatever I was eating. Plus, it really doesn't fold up well at all, Jesse. You know, there's no way that's gonna be able to be nested together or slide onto my couch, right? Right, functionally, it just didn't hold up to yep. me. Yep, so then <laughs> it was back to the drawing board, right? Back to the drawing board. So we came up with a few more designs, just with uh, wanting to keep that organic curved form and then this is the one we came up with. The next part of the process was to create a computer model, a 3D rendering of it. Yeah, which is really cool. You know, he was able to put it into a computer simulator and spin it all around and collapse and really get a good look on what it's gonna be like. But anyways, we finally came up with the design that we were gonna go for this week. And I just love it, man. I think that this thing is perfect for what I was thinking. It's super stable, rock solid, and it still has a contemporary look that could be on, you know, the Enterprise. So what do you say we get to work? Cool, let's do it. Jesse, what I love about this project, this is all the material you're gonna need. A couple of two and a quarter inch blocks squared up three feet long, a little bit of three quarter that I got out of a piece of scrap, and a sizable chunk of wood. This one here is 12 inches by two feet, right? Yep. <laughs> Dude, I gotta tell you, when I first envisioned this table, I didn't wanna build it out of walnut at all. I was thinking tiger maple or even some veneering, right? That's right, and I pushed walnut because I love that richness of the brown wood and it has uh, blues and purples in it as well. It's just <laughs> yeah, a beautiful dude. wood. Pushing it is like <laughs> saying it lightly. He held the line. He was like, walnut, walnut. <laughs> now, the thing of it is, how do we take a big chunk of wood like this and bend it to look like that right there, right, man? Right. So what's the process? 
So we were able to print out a full-scale drawing. And from that full-scale drawing, we adhered it down to a piece of plywood, a three-quarter plywood, and traced that template. Just a matter of cutting it, trimming on the bandsaw, and cleaning it up. Once we had the template made, we needed to make a form, right? Right. So that template gives us all the information we need to create a form. That's right. We can screw it right down to a piece of MDF and trim it. And then clean it up with uh, some hand tools, and then you just need to build the stack. The reason why it's stacked so high is because our stock is two and a half inches thick. Right. Now, we needed to make a second you know, half of this form because we need to clamp things in between it. The trick is, how do you take a big honking piece of wood like this, Jesse, and put it in a form <laughs> to change its shape? Yeah, we got to do a little bit of cutting and manipulating the wood to get there. Yeah, because it would be impossible to bend this piece of wood to that shape. So I'm going to head to the table saw. I'll be right back. Sounds good. What we need to do is cut these two two and a half inch chunks into one eighth strips, all right? Now, the first thing you want to do is make sure you have a nice new blade. <laughs> I know everybody doesn't like to spend the money on them, but for this application, it's totally, totally worth it, all right? Now, I'm going to take my combination square and hold it on the bed. Not the insert, but the bed. I'm going to slide it right up against my blade. Now, I can see that it's not square, so I'm just going to move my blade until the light disappears between the saw blade and the combination square. That's looking pretty good. I'm going to lock it down. Secondly, you want to make sure that this fence is parallel to that blade. What I like to do is grab my combination blade, all right, and I'm going to move it right over. I'm going to hold it on this first tooth close to the bottom in the front, just so it's barely touching it. Now I'm going to take the same tooth, roll it all the way to the back with my finger, and double check it with my blade. All right, that is perfect. Next, I want to take what's called a splitter. It's this piece right here. This goes right behind the blade on all table saws now. This is going to prevent that piece of wood from collapsing in on the blade or even kicking back on you. Put my insert in there, and I'm good to go. Next, you need to make sure you have a really good push stick. Since you're going to be cutting really, really small pieces through this blade, I like this particular model right here because it has a little kick on the back of it, so I know that this is going to stabilize my piece of wood and my hands aren't going to be anywhere near it. When it comes to the piece of wood, we decided that we thought that the quarter sawn, which is right here, would look good from the front. You can see that the grain pattern just doesn't match what we're looking for. So you want to make sure that the piece of wood is square, which it is. A really cool trick to make sure that this is going to be glued together the way it's cut apart is you want to take a marker and put an index right across here. So when I cut this into eighth inch pieces, I can restack it together in the same sequential order so you'll see like no glue lines. Finally, I just need to move my fence over to one eighth of an inch and make all 12 cuts. All right, Jess, moment of truth, buddy. Yeah. Time to glue these pieces together. What have you been doing? So we got the form set up with six clamps so we can get a good amount of pressure on, on all sides. That's right. Now, check this out. You can see that we have all of the uh, indicator lines from before I cut on the table saw. Mm -hmm. Jess, you're going to love this, buddy. So when I squeeze them all together, you can see that my indicating line is right there. Looks great. Now, we need to glue these all together, and you only need glue on one side of each one of these? Just on the insides. Okay, yep. just on the inside. So that means we don't want glue on this side or that side. So this one's going to lay this way, and I'm basically just going to lay them out, and when it comes to the last one, dude, I'm just going to flip it backwards so I don't get any glue on it. Yeah. So now I'm just going to take it and bring it right over to the form. All right, so it's just a moment of truth. Clamping this bad boy together. Now, it's really important to make sure that you clamp from the middle out. I know a lot of times, you know, guys would clamp the two ends because mm -hmm. it would stabilize the piece. Yeah. But what will happen is you'll put too much clamping pressure on the outsides, and then you won't be able to get appropriate pressure on the middle. 
It's looking good. Now, do yourself a favor and take all this glue off now because it's a lot easier to deal with it when it's wet than when it's dry, right, dude? So, Jess, how long should this take to dry? Uh, you sh we should leave it in the form for at least 24 hours. So after 24 hours, we're gonna end up with two pieces that look just like this, buddy. Pretty sweet, right? Yeah. What I love about this project is that these two, you know, bent laminations become, yeah, buddy, the full legs of our project. Now, you can see that they're still pretty ratty. So what I wanna do is bring it over to the joiner, clean them up on, on one edge, then I'm gonna send them through the thickness plane at the same time so they're both the exact same size. Then, what do we need to do? So we're gonna put the template back onto the piece and then cut the ends. Okay, cool. Let me do that to this piece and I'll see you at the bench. Great. Heads up, man. <laughs> <laughs> now we have those two funky pieces cut, shaped, and ready to go. Let me show you how they go on our table. We have a left and a right side with the S-curves that are held together with a pivot point here in the middle. We also have a modus and tenon rail down here that basically keeps the bottom from racking. Now, check this out, you're just gonna love it. When I flip it upside down, the way that this thing works is that it collapses with this aluminum rod. You could never do that if you didn't round over the corners. I understand why we rounded them up here at the top, Jesse, but why'd you round them here at the bottom? When, the, when we rounded the bottom, it just allows the table to open up and slide easier. Yeah. Now, the way that it collapses, comes right in, baby, drops down, and it's sweet, right? Mm. Jess, now what's the first thing we need to do? First thing we need to do is lay out the mortise. Okay, for our two inch rail, right? Right, so to do that, we go four and three quarters in. That's right. Yep. Now, when it came to the pivot point, what did we have to do? For the pivot point, we went in about a half of an inch from the end, yep. and then three eighths inch from either side. All right. Now, what's the layout for uh, the roundover? For the roundover, we're going to use a little quarter, which <laughs> is a trick. Nice. I put it right in the center, and just round it over. Man, that pencil line is pretty tough to see. So what I like to do is just grab a white pencil, and I just trace it in a little bit so I can see the marks bouncing off the walnut. Mm. Now, when it came to doing the mortise, I figured, why not? I'm gonna do some old school work right here, buddy. Some chisels, right? Nice. All right, that's looking pretty good. You get the idea. I'm just gonna continue to work this mortise until it's a half an inch deep and it's nice and square all the way around. Jesse, what are you gonna be doing? I'm gonna be drilling out the pivot hole. Then we're gonna take it over and round off the corners. All right, cool. The next thing I need to do is cut these pieces in half. I have my fence set at an inch, you know, to the center of the blade. I'm just gonna make sure I cut it nice and easy, then I'll take all four pieces over to the um, thickness planer, then I'll see Jesse over the bench. Now that we have all our legs together, Jesse, time to put them together. They look cool, right? Now, the way we put these together is check it out. We have a center hole on both pieces with this cool little gizmo right here. It's called a roto hinge. And check it out. <laughs> nice, right? I just love it. Now, you would think it would be pretty simple, but it's not that easy, is it? Yeah, it's a little tricky. What's the first step of the process? So the first step is to take our template again. In the template, we've found the center point already. And then we take it and tap down a few times, yep. get the alignment. And now what we're gonna do is drill our hole. Now what size bit is that? This is a 3 8 inch bit. Okay. Cool. 
Now, the challenge is, how do we get the center of that hole on the corresponding piece, right, Jesse? Yep, it's a simple little trick. Cool. It's a center finder. And we just put it in here. Now that we have the center finder in there, we're gonna put our legs together, align them, and then press down on it. Now we have that point. <laughs> That's awesome. We're gonna drill it again. Now, the next thing we need to talk about is our rail. You can see that we have this really cool rail down here at the bottom, and this is to hold the bottom of this piece together from falling apart. It's two inches wide, five eighths thick, and the tenons are gonna be a half inch in from either end. Since we have this really cool curve, I've already drawn it. So Jesse, it's just a matter of me going to the table saw, the bandsaw, and I'll be right back. To cut the tenon, I'm gonna do it right here at the table saw. You can notice that I've already got my dado blade in the saw. Now I have a dado stack in here that's five eighths of an inch. I only need a half inch tenon. So what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that I lower it down to an eighth of an inch, grab my square, that's looking pretty good. Now what you wanna do is make sure you're at the top of the rotation of the blade, lock her in, bring my fence over. I've already got a sacrificial fence on there. So even though I have a five eighths dado blade in there, I can bring it over to a half an inch. No problem, just like that. Lock her down, grab my gear, I'll make my first two cuts, then I'll just double check it inside my mortise until it fits nice and tight, then I can just finish the other side. After I cut the shape on my rail, it was just a matter of cutting my 316 shoulders, then dry fitting this piece, just like that. Now, what's up with that piece of aluminum? So I picked this up at the local hardware store, and aluminum's soft enough to chop on the chop saw. Yep. So it's the same dimension as a rail, yep. and we're just gonna glue it in with some epoxy. That's right, so we're gonna epoxy that in, and I'm gonna use a regular yellow glue here, so we might as well bang this thing together. Let's do it. All right, man, that's looking pretty good. And now this is gonna be really simple to put together. Grab that side. Here we go. Just eyeball it. Put it on there, dude. How you looking? Nice and tight. All right. Perfect. Now, since this is such a small piece, we don't need a lot of clamping pressure, right, Jesse? No. This, these two clamps will do. Yeah, definitely. That's beautiful. So, what do you say we give this a chance to dry? In the meantime, let's go bang out the top. What I love about this top, Jesse, it's made out of this piece of wood right here. It's two and a half inches thick, and it's basically a big, fat slab of wood. If you look at our top here, look at the grain pattern here on the left, it's identical to the one on the right. Now, the way that we get this right here, it's called book matching. So what I need to do is get this big, fat chunk of wood and cut it in half. So I'll, I'll do that, and you stay in here looking cool. The first thing I wanna do to cut this board in half is right here at the table saw. This is a really huge chunk of wood, so I'm just gonna cut both edges of the block before I go to the bandsaw. The reason why is because the table saw blade will create kind of like a groove for the bandsaw blade to track down, and then it should stay right in the middle. Now that I have my curve cut and my board, you can see that the bandsaw blade will track down this nice and easy. Now look it, when you make a cut like this, be super careful. You never wanna put your hands right behind here because you don't know what kind of tension this board is under and if it cracks, you don't want your two thumbs <laughs> to go right through that blade. So make sure you have a couple of push sticks.
So now, all I need to do is take these, buzz them down to the proper thickness, and glue them together. After I cut the blank in half and I cut into my boards and I milled them down to size, Jesse, look at the big knot that was in the middle of it. No sweat. You know, what you want to do is just take this piece over here, like that. And I think that the stripe is going to look pretty neat in the middle. And you know what? That little bit's not going to bother me. I'll just put a little epoxy in there. Now, <laughs> if you've ever tried to glue boards together like this and you've had the problem of they're going this kind of thing, it's probably because your joiner is not perfectly square. So what I'm going to do, check this out. I'm just going to flip it and hold them together like this, Jesse, mm -hmm. and throw it right into my vise. You get that clamp right there and you can clamp that down for me. Right, that's looking pretty good. Yep, perfect. I'm gonna grab my hand plane and just go across this edge until I take an equal amount of material off of both boards. What's cool about this is that no matter what angle this is on, when you fold it out, it'll be 90, and when you go to glue it together and clamp it, it's gonna be perfectly flat and it won't pop up on you. So all we need to do is fold it back out. There you go, Jesse. Put them together, and that joint is gonna be perfect once we put some clamping pressure on it. So what you say you just glue it together, then we can bring this project home. Great. After the glue dried, I clean up the surfaces, then I cut this really cool shape into it. And I think that it looks awesome. Looks great. The next challenge is how do we attach the base to the top? We needed to make a few cleats, right, man? Yeah. So you can see that we have a couple of cleats. Jesse, how big are they? They are 5 eighths by an inch and a quarter. Okay, now I already have a couple of pre drilled holes. You get the drill? Mm. Yeah, drill those on. Sweet. Nice. Now, we also took the time to drill our 3 8 pivot hole in the side of both of our uh, aprons. Now, Jesse, grab that and stick it right on there. Now, again, we use those roto hinges up here at the top, so it's going to spin nicely. It goes nice and smooth. Oh, that's pretty good, huh? Hold it on my mark. That looks good, right, man? Looks good. Our last screw. Cool. Now, the next thing we needed to do is make sure that this bar was locked into place so it would open and close <laughs> without falling apart. We basically just made a little cage right here. It has an apron on the front and an apron on the back with a couple of bars that keep our um, piece of aluminum in place, right? Right. So all we need to do is screw it down, Jesse, then we can talk about the finish. Wow! I mean, look at this finish. I gotta tell you what, that walnut looks fantastic. Explain to us how we got that finish. We we'll put a tongue oil finish on it. Okay. It may look dull now. Yeah, it sure does. That's why I don't <laughs> like walnut, because it looks totally flat hey, like cardboard. Hey, watch this. All right, man. <laughs> nice. You know what, Jesse? I have to admit, the walnut looks really, really great. I mean, what can I say? When the kid's right, the kid's right. Now, if you look at the piece that we did first, it looks really beautiful, but look at this big, fat, ugly bolt right here. You know, after we built this project, we found that roto hinge, and that's what we used today on the project. And it's kind of like the staple of this week's project. What happened was I took this crazy idea of a 1950s TV tray, I called up a friend, and we came up with a design that I thought was really great. But since it needed to be a functional piece of furniture, it didn't work at all. Then we needed to redesign it, and we ended up with the piece that we were really happy with, then, Jesse, we haggled over what material that we wanted to build it out of. Ultimately, I think that we got the right piece of material, and I think that it looks great. So, if you're at home struggling about the design aspects of what your piece is, don't ever be afraid to change directions at no matter what stage you're in. <laughs> well, listen, I'm Tony McDonald. He's Jesse Shaw. I had a great time. I hope you did, too, and we'll see you next time right here on Rough Cut. Keep going, man. Keep going. <laughs>